if you are visiting or here for the first time, we're glad you've decided to join our church family in worshiping our great God here this morning. If you are new or visiting, a great way to get in contact with the church is through the connection card that's in the seat pocket in front of you. There's a number of QR codes that you can scan to find out more info about some of the ministries that we offer here at the church. You can also sign up for a weekly email, which will arrive in your inbox every Wednesday morning, and it'll give you the latest info and happenings, what's happening here at WLA, so you make sure to sign up for that, and it's just a great opportunity to uh, stay on top of what's happening here at the church. Soup Sunday is happening after this service in the core. Every first Sunday of the month is designated Soup Sunday, and that's uh, a great time to have a, a bowl of homemade soup to visit with the church family. We do ask that you sign up for that so people, so we know how much soup to make. Uh, so make sure if you miss out this month, we'll be back in action the first Sunday of April. So you can sign up for that then. We have a men's breakfast coming up. Uh, it's a morning of food and fellowship happening March 23rd at 8.30 a.m. geared towards the men of WLA. Registration is open on Eventbrite. And you'll want to register before March 10 to catch the early bird price of $15. After March 10th, general admission will be 20 So make sure to take advantage of that. For more information, please visit the Connection Desk or talk to Graham Buchanan, Director of Men's Ministry. We have a Mission Peru auction dinner coming up, and you are all invited to that. It's happening on Saturday, April 13th here at WLA. So this is June. We are sending a team of students from our youth ministry to Trujillo, Peru. And to fundraise support, we're hosting uh, this particular auction dinner. So the way it works throughout the evening, you'll bid on a three-course meal with the members of your table. And all proceeds will go towards sending our team this June. It's always a wonderful evening together, a little bit of friendly competition, and a chance to hear from some of our Mission Peru team members. So registration is now open. Registration will close on Sunday, March 17th. And you want to make sure to head over to the South Foyer kiosk after the service to sign up for that, either as a table captain where you're responsible for putting a table of eight together or just signing up as an individual or a couple, and then they will place you at a table. You can also register by email, wlayouth750 at gmail.com, and any questions can be sent there as well. So that's a great opportunity to support the youth ministry and their missions initiative to Peru. Just a friendly reminder as well, next week we spring forward. So I know most of our clocks adjust automatically nowadays, but we just thought we'd give you that friendly reminder. That's it for announcements, and uh, I'll invite you to stand for the call to worship this morning. I'll be reading some select passages from Psalm 103 this morning, which is a psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Moving to verse 10, the psalmist says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, So the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So David starts this psalm by exhorting each singer to lift their soul to the Lord, to bless his name. And then he goes on to list the benefits that the soul should be careful not to forget. And there's three in particular I'd like to point out. There's three comparisons made for the kindness of God. And starting in verse 11, We show the abundance of his love, where David says, so great is his steadfast love. In verse 12, we're reminded of the decisiveness of that love, 
As far as the east is from the west, our sins are removed from us. And lastly, in verse 13, we're reminded of the enduring quality of his love. As the Father shows compassion, this is a picture of the Lord showing his, his compassion on those who fear him. So these are all reasons to praise his name together, that our great God knows us individually, specifically, and intimately. So let's celebrate this fact by singing together, How Great Thou Art. Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout. The universe display Then sings my soul My Savior God to thee How great thou art How great thou art Then sings my soul
Congregation, we are celebrating communion this morning, coming to the Lord's table to remember and rejoice in all that Christ has done. Here at Westland Alliance Church, we practice what we call open communion. Uh, and by open communion, we mean something specific. We mean that the Lord's table is open to all of those who have repented of their faith and have turned to Christ in faith entrusting themselves to him and his work of redemption on their behalf. If that's you, we welcome you to celebrate communion with us. You don't need to be a member here or even a regular here. If you're a disciple of Christ, please uh, join with us this morning. If you're here this morning and that doesn't describe you, if you have never repented of your sins and turned to faith in Christ, entrusting yourself to him, and his work of atonement on Calvary, then we want you to participate, but we would ask that you participate in a different way. We would ask that you let the emblems pass you by and that rather you participate this morning through observation and through consideration. We ask that you would observe closely as we come to the Lord's table, the words that are said, the prayers that are prayed, the actions that are taken. And we would ask that you consider this morning Christ's work on Calvary and availing yourself of his work through repenting of sins and believing. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. And as we do so, I would ask those who are helping serve communion to come to the front and to remain standing. Congregation, let's pray. Merciful Lord, we do not presume to come to your table trusting in our own righteousness. But rather this morning we come trusting in your abundant and great mercy. We acknowledge that we are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table. And yet you are the Lord who delights in showing mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, to eat this bread and to drink this cup that our body and souls may be made clean by Christ's body and blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Let's come to the Lord's table with a heart posture of thanksgiving. 
Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. We thank you that he made there a full atonement for the sins of the world, offering once for all his one sacrifice of himself. And we thank you that he instituted and in his gospels commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. And so we do. Amen. And the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and gave God thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. In the same way, Jesus, after supper, took the cup and he gave God thanks and he gave it to the disciples saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Almighty and everlasting God, we wholeheartedly thank you, for you have graciously given us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you assure us thereby of your favor and goodness towards us. And you assure us that we are members in the mystical body of your Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people. And you assure us that we are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom by the merits of Christ's most precious death. We humbly ask you, O Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Well, our hope is centered in the cross, so we'll sing to that end just now. I'll invite you to stand. Cling to the cross and everything it means. No, it's the only hope there is for saving me. For without your great mercy, I would be forever lost. With a thankful heart, I come. Cling to the cross. Sing that again together. Cling to the cross, and everything it means. I know it's the only hope there is for saving me. For without your great mercy, I will be forever lost. With a thankful heart, I come. Cling to the cross Standing at the empty tomb 
promises I have in you rise. I was made alive in you. Everything you said was true. You suffered, died, and rose to bring us life. I cling to the cross. the only hope there is for saving me. For without your great mercy, I would be forever lost. With a thankful heart, I come. With a thankful heart, I come. With a thankful behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Let's sing that again, just the whole together. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. No turning back, no turning back. Amen. You may be seated. And I'll invite one of our elders, Barry Usher, up for the elders' prayer. morning. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious Father, we come before you with our hearts laid bare, knowing that you see all things, even the depths of our souls. Your word declares that all the earth should fear you, and we stand in awe of your majesty and power. We acknowledge that when you speak, it comes to be. You command, and it stands firm forever, revealing the purposes of your heart through all generations. Your word, O Lord, is upright, and your works are done with unwavering faithfulness. Your righteousness and justice fill the earth, and we are surrounded by your steadfast love. And we praise you for your love that's been lavished upon us through your Son. And Father, by your Spirit, we proclaim that you are worthy of all honor and glory. You are the source of all that is true and good and righteous. And we recognize our dependence upon you for all things. And we come before you eager to see you glorified and exalted in us. Eager for our lives to bring honor to Christ, whether in this life uh, or at death. Truly the cross before us and the world is behind us. Father, words can't begin to express the praise that's due to you, but we humbly try saying, with the hymn writer, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Father, may our lives be like songs of praise to you, resounding now and forevermore. And at the same time, we confess that our struggles with sin remain, and we often fail. And despite your redemption of us through the precious blood of your Son, we are prone to rebellion 
giving into temptation and following our own evil desires, acting in ways contrary to your will. We confess our struggle with anger and pride, deceit, envy, and sexual immorality and our lack of love for you. So, Father, we bring our sins before you, agreeing with your assessment of them that even the smallest sin is a wicked offense against your perfect holiness and rightly deserving of your eternal wrath and punishment. Yet we trust in your word, echoing the psalmist who said, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Father, in this moment of confession and repentance, As we come to you through Christ, we ask you to help us to experience the grace of your forgiveness. Grant us the comfort of restored communion with you through Christ and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, empowering us to walk in righteousness. Brothers and sisters, take a few moments of independent prayer of confession and repentance before God. Father, we thank you that we don't need to waste time wallowing in our misery and guilt. Instead, we can flee to your son, Jesus, our savior and mediator who came into the world to save sinners. And through faith, we find ourselves before your throne, marked with his blood and clothed in his righteousness, welcomed by you in relationship as your children. We praise you and thank you for this. And it's as children that we come to you, bringing our requests and our needs to you, our souls waiting on you, our help and our shield, our hearts being made glad in you as we trust in your holy name. So in faith, we lift up our sister Paula Reibling to you this morning as she and her family grieved the death of her husband, Steve. Father, strengthen and comfort her, allowing her to continue to testify of your grace at work in her life. Father, we pray also for Marcel and Kelly and their children serving in Angola. And particularly, we ask that uh, you would be with Ethan as he recovers from a broken leg. Help him to place his trust in you in this time as he deals with feelings of discouragement from missing out on some activities. Father, we, we pray for Kelly's school, that there would be unity among the staff and students, and that you would bless them with spiritual and academic growth continue to keep this family safe as they serve you together. And Father, as we were encouraged at last week's Koporos Conference, would you enlarge our hearts for missions? Help us to sense the urgent need for us to engage with your calling to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Guide us, whether we take on the role of those who actually go to the mission field or those who work to support those sent out from among us. And I ask that you would bless our missions committee, particularly with wisdom and great joy as they investigate future endeavors. Guide them, I pray. And we pray the same for our brothers and sisters at CBC Ilderton and Pastor Andrew. Enlarge their capacity for global missions and bless them with greater fruitfulness in their local evangelism and outreach. And also continue to give them wisdom and discernment as they seek an associate pastor to join their staff. We ask that you would bring the right man at the right time who will effectively serve for the sake of the gospel in Ilderton. And Father, as we continue in our worship this morning, through the reading of Scripture and the preaching of your word, give us faith to receive your word, understanding to know what it means, and the will to put it into practice. And like the psalmist says, let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at Westland Alliance Church, we do not receive tithes and offerings during the course of the service. If you brought those things with you this morning, there is a small box at the back of the sanctuary on your right-hand side as you leave. 
you can deposit those things there and they will be taken care of. If you are interested in giving digitally or online, you can find out information about that from our church op office or our church website. We continue to be grateful to God for his provision for this church through the faithful giving of the congregation. I want to remind members and associates about the annual general meeting tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, we hope that you can make it. Uh, this is an encouraging and edifying time in which we uh, look back at the year that's been, 2023, and consider all the ways that God has uh, graciously blessed this church, and then look forward to 2024, and looking forward to those ways in which we look for God to bless us in the coming year. So I want to encourage all of you to be there tonight. Uh, there is a lot of information which you uh, need to avail yourself of, uh, ideally before coming, and uh, I have announced that the last couple Sundays. Uh, there are ministry reports, there's the report of the nominating committee, uh, there's the budget, all things that you can look at and find both uh, digitally, they've been emailed out to you, and you can find uh, hard copies in the foyers and see those. There are a uh, list of who's up for elders election. For those who have never been on the board before, there's bios that you can read. And uh, I would just encourage you, without me going through all of the things, to avail yourself of that information. I do want to make one last mention that tonight we have to strike a nominating committee. And so if you can think of someone who you believe would be good to serve on that committee for our nomination of elders and their election for next year, then why don't you speak to them this afternoon, ask if they'll let their name stand, and then you can nominate them tonight. It's best to ask them in case they don't want to do it, and we can avoid an awkward situation at the meeting of you nominating and them refusing. But that would be a great thing for you to do before uh, we came tonight. So I look forward to seeing everyone there. I'd like to invite Nancy Blackwell for the public reading of God's Word. Good morning. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 23. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore, David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought against the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. When Abiathar the son of Ahimelech had fled to David to Keilah, he had come down with an ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that has gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as his servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah, and they went 
wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition, and David remained in the strongholds in the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David said, sorry, David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Haresh, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Haresh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Haresh, and Jonathan went home. When the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Haresh, on the hill of Hakalah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go, make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there, for it is told me that he is very cunning. See therefore and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you, and he is in the land I will search him among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, so he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon, Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry, and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore, that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of Engedi. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we continue on in our sermon series through the book of 1 Samuel. My sermon is entitled, The Lord Prospers and Protects. And as we just heard, we are considering 1 Samuel chapter 23. That puts us about three quarters of the way through the book of 1 Samuel. And as we discussed at the very beginning of this sermon series, there are three people who dominate the book of 1 Samuel. Samuel and his story was what the book focused on in its early chapters. Saul then came into view, and following Saul, David is now at the forefront. And as these three stories have come together and intertwined, the author has used comparison, seeking out similarities, highlighting differences. He's used those as major storytelling techniques. And this is, if you have noticed, particularly pronounced in chapters 21 through 23, and the contrasts are significant. At Nob, Saul is the destroyer of Israel. But here at Keilah, David becomes the savior of Israel. Saul has regularly complained that none of his advisors disclose urgent matters to him, and yet we see God regularly discloses to David all that he needs to know. Saul's comrade is Doeg, the Edomite murderer, who bloodies Saul's hands as his proxy. David's support is Jonathan, the royal son, who strengthens his hands in God. Now the contrasts, as I said, are noteworthy. 
And perhaps the most important contrast that we see in these chapters is that the Lord is with David, prospering him, protecting him. And the Lord is clearly against Saul. That contrast points us in the direction of the main idea of this passage, and we will pursue that by considering how the Lord prospers and protects David. Point number one, the Lord prospers David in battle, verses one through five. The Lord prospers David by guiding him in the conflict at Keilah with the Philistines. Now perhaps it was David's narrow escape from the Philistines at Gath which we considered last week, that reinforced his need for divine counsel when he was to be dealing with the Philistines. Thus, as news reaches David's ears of the Philistines harassing and marauding in Keilah, what does he do? He inquires of the Lord. Now, Keilah is a small walled sediment in Judah. It stands on a steep hill. It's about five kilometers south of Ajalom, do you remember Agilum? That's the location of the cave that David was hiding in in chapter 22. Now the time of the year is early summer and the Philistines are stealing harvested crops that are awaiting processing at the threshing floors. Now Keilah is an isolated city. It's not far from Gath. It's not far from regions of the Philistines. And therefore it was particularly susceptible to marauders. And so David responds to this threat. And he responds to this threat against Keilah and against Israel in a way that is appropriate to covenantal kingship, even though he is not yet Israel's king. We're told he inquired of the Lord regarding a possible attack on these Philistines. Now this really was a fairly normal course of action. We saw it in the book of Judges. After Joshua's death, the Israelites inquired of the Lord who would be the first to fight against the Canaanites. We saw Deborah and Barak inquire of the Lord concerning Israel's enemy, Sisera. And, of course, Gideon inquired of the Lord considering, uh, concerning the enemy, Midian. Now, as David goes and inquires of the Lord, the Lord directs him and directs him to act, telling him to go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Now, David's men are doubtful about this. Remember, they are currently on the run from Saul. They're fugitives. They're, in many ways, running for their lives, and so they're hesitant to get into a skirmish with the Philistines. But the Lord confirms his guidance. David inquires again, and the Lord says, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And so David and his men obey. And as they obey God, God prospers them. They not only defeat the Philistines, but they also capture some spoils of their own. And so David saves the inhabitants of Keilah, which, as I mentioned, is in stark contrast to Saul, Saul who recently destroyed the inhabitants of Nob. Now this brief episode at the start of chapter 3 opens up for us a discussion today in regards to how we receive guidance as God's people, as the new covenant followers of Christ. And let me state emphatically and clearly, the primary way in which we receive direction from the Lord is through the completed canon of Scripture. The Apostle Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 writes, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Theologian Thomas Schreiner comments on this verse from 2 Peter saying, Since believers have in the Old Testament scriptures a prophetic word that is confirmed by the transfiguration, they should pay close attention to the word and heed what it says. The readers are to pay attention to the prophetic word as it has been apostolically interpreted. And so we have the 
prophetic word of the Old Testament. We have the apostolic interpretation of the prophetic word in the New Testament. And thus, to us, the Old and New Testaments are a lamp shining in a dark place. I fairly frequently get questions about God's guidance. How do I know what God's will for me is? And the book I recommend most frequently in regards to discerning God's will was written by Kevin DeYoung. It actually has a pretty humorous title. Just Do Something, A Liberating Approach to Finding God's Will, or How to Make Decisions Without Dreams, Visions, Fleeces, Impressions, Open Doors, Random Bible Verses, Casting Lots, Liver Shivers, Writing in the Sky, etc., the young writes, God can speak to people in many ways, but his full and complete revelation is now spoken by his son, Jesus Christ. As we'll see, God speaking by his son includes not only divine revelation in the person of Christ, that is, Jesus shows us what God is like, but also divine revelation through the spirit of Christ speaking in the scriptures. Now, I believe there are other ways God directs and guides us. But brothers and sisters, our go-to in terms of God's guidance, in terms of God's will for our life, is God's instruction manual, manual, the Bible. When we read the Bible, we can be assured that as we interpret it accurately, we are hearing from God. And therefore, that is the norm for us as we seek God's will for our lives and we should live accordingly. I strongly recommend to Young's book, Just Do Something on this topic. The Lord prospers David. He prospers him militarily and economically by guiding him to save the people of Keilah. But these brave deeds southwest of Jerusalem also draw the attention of Saul. Point number two, the Lord protects David from Saul Verse 6 through 14. David again seeks divine guidance and God again directs his steps. Now most nations today have some sort of intelligence gathering networks. They'll have a government agency or two or three that is responsible for the collection and the analysis and the exploitation of information. And that's usually for support of law enforcement or national security or military objectives. Canada has CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. The United States has the CIA and the United Kingdom has MI6. Currently, the main intelligence agencies in Israel are the Mossad, which deals with foreign intelligence, and Shin Bet, which deals with domestic intelligence. I wonder as I read this chapter if the precursors to those agencies were around in the time of David and Saul, because both of them have all the information they need on the other one. Someone, some ones, are telling Saul what David is up to and are telling David what Saul is up to. Saul knew what David had done in Keilah. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And Saul's agents report David's current location at Keilah. And Saul immediately decides he's going to go after him. David is not out in the wilderness where he might be hard to find and hard to trap. No, now he is in a walled city with gates. Maybe it's a time he can catch him. Saul, either grossly mindless of reality or intentionally duplicitous, makes a statement about David. He says, God has given him into my hand. Now, no reader at this point in this book could hear that declaration and think it to be anything other than absolute nonsense. Saul has clearly no idea what God is doing. And the central event in this episode of the, episode of the 23rd chapter is David's pursuit of divine counsel. Almost half the words in verses 6 through 14 depict David seeking the Lord's guidance. The author is 
surely trying to emphasize David's reliance on the Lord, the vitality of David's relationship with the Lord, and again, the stark difference between Saul and David. Now in this case, in these verses, David employs the ephod, which refers to the elaborate breastplate of the high priest. And that breastplate contained the urim and the thummim. And these were devices that they used in ancient Israel to figure out from God what they should do or what was going on. It's not really clear how these things worked or how they were employed. It's very likely they were some sort of stone or gem. And I imagine they were cast or thrown or something like that. We're not sure. The point is, however, that David sought the guidance of God. And God answered David. Through the Lord's answers, David confirms that Saul would indeed try to catch him in Keilah and that the people of Keilah would indeed hand him over to Saul. And this allows David to evade Saul again. David and his men escape to safe places in the wilderness. And the author indicates that it was God who was not giving David into Saul's hands. The protection of God and warning David through the Urim and Thummim leads David into the wilderness of Ziph, now 26 kilometers south of Bethlehem, where he again experiences the prospering of God, this time through friendship. Point number three, the Lord prospers David in friendship, verse 15 through 18. Shortly, David will again find himself in a difficult situation at the hand of Saul. But between these two troubling events in which Saul is pursuing David, David finds encouragement and strength through the fellowship he has with his like-minded and devoted covenant friends. I hope that all of us are aware of the impact that gospel friendships can have on our lives. Certainly, the New Testament underscores the importance of mutual encouragement amongst the faithful. We are commanded in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 to encourage one another and build one another up. And again in Hebrews 10.25 where the author indicates we are to be encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Jonathan encourages David and encourages him in a biblical way that we can learn from. First of all, he reminds David of God's promises. And secondly, he urges him to act bravely and valiantly in light of those promises. Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. The result of such encouragement is the strengthening of David's hand in God. During this meeting, which is the final recorded meeting of the two, we have no evidence that they ever met again, Jonathan confirms the commitments that they had made to each other. Now certainly this morning we could spend some time applying the text in regards to our call to encourage one another, and yet I would have us make a different application this morning. I would have us make a gospel application that sees Jesus not only as the true and better David, which we have done throughout the last couple of chapters, but one that sees Jesus as the true and better Jonathan. You see, Jonathan was the son of a king who despised his throne in order to help the enemy of his father. Jesus is the true and better son of a king. The son of a king who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, according to Philippians 2, 6-9. Paul also describes something similar in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, when he writes, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
so that you by his poverty might become rich. What is the reason behind Jesus not grasping his divine kingship? What is this richness of grace that the son of a king became poor for? What is behind his care for those who have rejected his father and become his father's enemy through the rebellion and through their sin? Well, the answer to all those questions is the gospel. You see, Jesus is the true and greater Jonathan, the true and greater son of a king who did not divine or did not grasp his divine royalty, who was willing to part with his sovereign wealth, all for those who were enemies of his father. We read in Philippians that in the son of the king, Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, Philippians 1, 7. Jesus, as the true and better Jonathan, is the greater son of a greater king who did not grasp his divine kingship nor the divine riches that were his so that he might graciously forgive our sins and mercifully pay the penalty of our trespasses. And for all those who will acknowledge that they have disobeyed God, and acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God who died for their disobedience. For all those that put their trust in him, Jesus will save them. Would you, if you have never done that, consider doing that today? Consider putting your faith in Jesus Consider acknowledging your sins and recognizing that Jesus is the son of God, the son of a king who left all so that he could come and save you. Would you consider what we've already asked you to consider this morning as you observed and contemplated the Lord's Supper? Perhaps that's something we could help you with. We would love to speak with you about this. If, if that's you and you would say, I, I want help here. I recognize I'm a sinner. I want to put my faith in Christ. Then please come and talk to us. Speak to an usher. Speak to a greeter. Talk to someone you saw up here in the worship team and say, I need help with that. And we would love to help you. Because the great son of the king awaits. Come to him. We see that David is prospered by the Lord through his friendship with David. And that leads into another episode. Another episode with Saul in which the Lord again protects David. Point number four, the Lord protects David from Saul. Verse 19 through 29. The Lord provides David with protection through his providential care. Again, this week we have a psalm to consider that addresses this precise situation. It is a short psalm and worth reading in its entirety. Psalm 54. To the choir master, with stringed instruments, a maskil of David, when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us? O oh God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O oh God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Selah. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies. In your faithfulness, put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. The first words of Psalm 54 has David praying for help. He's in a dire situation again. He's in the wilderness of Ziph and the Ziphites, a clan from the family of Caleb, from his own tribe, the tribe of Judah. The Ziphites sell out David 
by going to Saul and telling them where he is. They even offer to help, and Saul says, I want this confirmed. Find out exactly where he is. Find out where he hides and get back to me, and the Ziphites oblige. And eventually, Saul and his men go looking for David. Now, David and his men are about eight kilometers south of Ziph in some rough, inhospitable country. And what happens here is an act, uh, interaction that we might call a very close call. And commentators disagree. Were they you know, on either side of a valley looking at each other or were they on the same mountain on either side of it? Either way, Saul and his men are close to David. A deadly battle seems inevitable. And yet God sovereignly controls the actions of the Philistines. At the very critical moment, the whole situation is turned around. Saul gets news that the Philistines have attacked Israel, and he is forced to abandon his pursuit of David in order to protect his kingdom. And David's commentary in Psalm 54 is crucial. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. David sees his escape clearly as a display of divine providential concern and control. You see, God has, through the Philistines, protected David from Saul. I did some research this past week in regards to this sermon, and I came across an organization called the Council of Foreign Relations. The CFR is an independent, nonpartisan organization dedicated to being a resource to help people better understand the world and the conflicts therein. And on their website, they have a very interesting interactive global conflict tracker. And this interactive tracker lists well over 25 current conflicts of significance that are occurring throughout the world. And the tracker offers you the opportunity to click on some filters. And so I wanted to know, what are the critical and significant conflicts that are getting worse? And so I clicked off those criteria, and it narrowed down the hostile situations to just five. And they're as follows. The war in Ukraine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the confrontation with Iran, the territorial disputes in, South, in the South China Sea, and the confrontation over Taiwan. Taiwan. All of these conflicts are significant and critical and getting worse. Now, for many of you, this may cause anxiety and fear as you look at the world around you. I remember back in the 80s when the Cold War caused me to be concerned about the world and nuclear war and what could happen. And perhaps these events, the, this conflict of nations causes you great concern and there may be some of you who are so negatively impacted that it even affects your mental health on a daily basis well that being the case all of us must remember that this final episode in chapter 23 that details God's sovereign protection teaches us what the Bible confirms elsewhere God is sovereign over the nations. In declaring, God is my helper, the Lord is the upholder of my life, in Psalm 54, David is affirming that God saved him using the Philistines as his agent and therefore demonstrating that God is sovereign over the nations. And so as we wrestle with anxiety-inducing and fear-producing global current events, as we watch the nations rage, we must remind ourselves that God is sovereign. We must strengthen our hearts with this great truth. If the events in Ukraine or the events in the Middle East or the events around China are gnawing away at your sense of security, if they're undermining your confidence, then let me encourage you to do what I do when fear begins to get the better of me. I go to Psalm 46. The first seven verses of Psalm 46 are a great help to us. God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. This is how David understood his salvation, a salvation that was brought about by the Philistines as they attacked Israel. And so we look to Psalm 46 and we remind ourselves that God is our refuge. And he can even use international conflicts to accomplish his will. And so let's safeguard our hearts with the knowledge of God's powerful rule over the nations of the world. Following this narrow escape, David and his men travel to the rugged hills west of the Dead Sea. Land where there are many cliffs and caves that offer protection and avoidance of detection. But as they do so, they go with the events of chapter 3 reinforcing in their minds, and certainly in the mind of David, that the Lord is a God who helps and prospers and protects his people. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these stories of David and how you prospered him and protected him. And I pray, Father God, that you would help each one of us by your spirit to come to a faith-filled confidence in your sovereignty over this entire planet and everything that goes on. I pray that by your spirit you would help those who see the current events and become anxious and fearful. Remind them, Father God, that you are a refuge and a strength, a very present help in trouble. And I pray, Father God, most of all, that you would help your people to see that you are still a God that prospers and protects his people. And that we see that most clearly in the work of Christ. That through his sacrifice, And through his resurrection, you offer your protection and spiritual prosperity for your people. I pray this in his name. Amen. I'll invite you to stand and we'll respond to the reminder that in spite of the valleys we may find ourselves in, the storms, that Christ is there with us. Let's sing together.
to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against when I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against when I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. as Christ is with us in the conflict of this world, he's also solved the worst conflict we could face, and that is enmity with God. And now he calls us his friends through what he has done on the cross for us. We'll sing to celebrate that to close our time this morning.
calls friend listen to the exhortation and the encouragement from 1 Samuel chapter 12 and respond do not turn aside from following the Lord and do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver for they are empty but fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake It has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Consider what great things he has done for you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 